Wurzel Gummidge by Barbara Youth and Todd. Probably, if it had not been for whooping cough, John and Susan would never have seen the scarecrow who stood in the middle of Ten Acre Field. They'd been sent out of the country at a time when the place was all muddy and slushy, almost empty of flowers and very full of lambs. All the excitement of being ill, meals in bed, black currant jelly and unexpected presents was over, and nothing remained except what Emily Goodenough called the tag end of a cough. Emily had been their nurse, but now she lived with her sister, who was married to a farmer in Scatterbrook, and she always invited the children down to the village for part of the summer holidays. They enjoyed those visits, even when the farm kitchen smelled of hay and clover and honey, but the country was disappointing in early spring. Whooping cough had left them cross and quarrelsome. They weren't allowed to go near other children because they were still infectious, and all the grown-up people of the place were too busy to be bothered with them. Every morning after breakfast, they were bundled into overcoats and mufflers and Wellington boots and told to go for a nice brisk walk and to keep out of mischief. John said he didn't want to have to go to walks every day with a girl of twelve who thought that she knew everything. And Susan said that she didn't want to have to go for walks with a boy of ten who didn't know anything at all. One morning, when they were in the middle of a quarrel, they came to a gap in a hedge and decided to go through it. We'd better not, said Susan. We'd better not go across the field. There's a man in the middle of it, and he's waving his arms at us. That's not a man, said John, when he peeped over the hedge. That's a scarecrow. It's a man. I saw him pointing at us, and then he, he waved his arms about. That's a scarecrow, said John, and if you're frightened of it, you must be a crow. Scared crow, scared crow. I'm not a crow, and I'm not scared. Susan followed John into the field. But he did move. I saw him. He stood still as soon as you looked at him. Now he's begun again. Look. The children stood quite still and stared at the figure in the middle of the field. They saw that it was dressed in an old black coat and long trousers and that its hat was tilted onto the back of its head. While they waited... The rain began to fall, slowly at first, and then very fast indeed. We'd better shelter under the hedge, said Susan. John answered crossly, There's no shelter under that silly little bit of hedge. We'd better take a shortcut across the field. So John had his way, and they began to run as quickly as possible over the deeply ploughed furrows. At last they reached the middle of the field. By this time they were standing almost opposite the scarecrow and Susan saw that he had a most friendly and pleasant face. It was cut out of a turnip, and one or two green leaves stuck out from under his black bowler hat. Look, cried Susan, he's got an umbrella. He's holding it in his... It, 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 it's sticking out from his arm, she ended. Let's take it, said John. My neck's as wet as anything and muddy. Well, I don't think we ought to, said Susan. Why not? It belongs to him. It's not a he, it's an it. Shh, said Susan. Let's see if the umbrella works, said John, and he walked towards the scarecrow. And then, just as he was nearly in reach of the broomstick arm, something whirred past his head. Whoa, said Susan. It's a robin, shouted John. It came out of the scarecrow's pocket. There must be a nest in it. Look. Don't touch it, said Susan. Don't touch it. Robins desert their nests if you touch their eggs, Emily told me. Oh, all right, replied John. We won't touch, but we'll look. Both children walked right up to the scarecrow. John had to stand on tiptoe before he could peep down into the tiny nest in the breast pocket of the coat. Uh, four eggs, said John. Susan stepped closer to the scarecrow, and as she did so, she trod on something that was quite stiff and crunchy. Oh, sorry, she said. What's the matter? said John. I, I trod on his foot, explained Susan. I, I trod on his, his straw boot. John looked down at the bottle straws that stuck out from each of the scarecrow's trouser legs. Those aren't boots, he said. They're the things the bottles are packed in. Come on, let's go home. I'm simply sopping. He lifted the umbrella from the scarecrow's stiff arm and began to put it up. It wasn't much of an umbrella, but it was better than nothing. I don't think you ought to take it, protested Susan. It belongs to him.
She looked up into the scarecrow's face as she spoke. The rain had washed his face almost clean, and several drops were trickling down his chin. He's crying, said Susan. He doesn't want us to take his umbrella. John grasped the umbrella more firmly and walked away. Susan felt so very cold and wet that she turned to follow John. Well, bring it back in the morning, she said. All right. What did you say? I, I didn't speak, answered John. You did. I didn't. Well, someone did. Susan sounded rather frightened, for she had an uncomfortable feeling that the scarecrow must have spoken. She turned round several times to look at him, but he seemed to be standing quite still. Susan felt rather glad that his back was turned to them. The children had a long, uncomfortable walk home. Susan didn't mind the walk so much as John did, for she had an excited feeling inside, though she didn't know why. Presently they passed the red house where Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton lived. She was the one person in the place who didn't seem to belong to it. She wore London clothes, even in the morning. The children generally met her on days when they were particularly messy and untidy. Five minutes later, they were slashing through the mud of Mr. Braithwaite's farmyard, and ten minutes after that, they were standing in their dressing gowns by the kitchen fire while Emily scolded and rubbed their hair and told Mrs. Braithwaite to hurry up with the black currant tea. It was all very warm and comforting. That evening, John was sent to bed early, but Susan was allowed to sit up and have her bread and milk by the fire. Susan jiggled her spoon and thought about things. She was careful not to make a noise, for that might remind Mrs. Braithwaite that it was long past bedtime. Emily had gone to a social in the village, and her sister had promised to look after the children. Mrs. Braithwaite was a thin, rather fussy little woman, who wasn't at all like the pictures of farmer's wives in any book that Susan had ever seen. She had a face that was rather like an angry weasel's. All the same, she was generally quite nice. Mr. Braithwaite looked exactly like a farmer. He was red and fair and fat. Mr. Braithwaite began all his sentences with hay, and he talked a great deal about the weather. As Susan was thinking about the scarecrow, the latch of the door rattled, then dropped then rattled again. Farmer Braithwaite, who'd been drowsing over his pipe, woke up with a jerk, glanced at the clock, stood up and said, Hey, I'll go up to the lambing pens now. Or oh, I'll make the barn ready, said Mrs. Braithwaite, in case he brings some lambs back with you. For once she forgot Susan. Lambs in Scatterbrook were more important than little girls. When the farmer and his wife had left the kitchen, the latch rattled again. The tortoiseshell cat glanced over her shoulder, and then the door opened, very slowly, and a strange-looking visitor shambled into the kitchen. Susan recognised him almost at once. Evening, said the scarecrow, and Susan wondered where she'd heard his voice before. He stared round the room. Presently he said, Evening, again. A, a good evening, said Susan politely. Ah, uh, you, you needn't be scared, he told her. It, it is only me. I'm not scared. Well, only just at first, before I remembered. <laughs> I, I thought you might be a tramp. Oh, hey, not me, he replied. I, I'm a standstill, that's what I am. I've been standing still, raining fine, day in and day out, roots down and roots up. He began to walk crabwise across the kitchen. One arm stretched out sideways and the other one crooked at the elbow. As he walked, his bottle straw boots made scratching noises on the stone floor. I, uh, you'll be wondering what I come for, he said. But Susan didn't particularly wonder, for it seemed perfectly natural for him to be there. I've, uh, I've come to save you a journey, said the scarecrow. At least, at least partly to save you a journey, and partly to save myself from missing it. For missing what? asked Susan. The umbrella. Where is it? Susan was so astonished that she could only point to the row of pegs on the door. The third peg held a cap and the scarecrow's umbrella, or what was left of it. Oh, I'm so sorry, said Susan at last. 
but you didn't seem to be using it, so... I know all about that, replied the Scarecrow. I heard you argue fine. Well, if he'd known you could talk, we'd have asked you to lend us the umbrella, explained Susan. Well, I might as well sit down, said the Scarecrow, and he moved towards the fireplace. I'll do ya. Oh, very well, thank you, said Susan politely. The Scarecrow looked puzzled. I, I mean, he said, I mean, I I'll... How do I sit down? I mean, is, is it difficult the first time you do it? But Susan couldn't remember, for she was so very used to sitting. She continued to look at the scarecrow. Just as she was wondering what to say next, he lifted the little hen robin from his pocket and gently rubbed his cheek with her wing feathers. I, I, I always use this her as an handkerchief, he explained. Then suddenly he moved backwards lifted both feet together and sat down on the hearth rug with his legs sticking straight out in front of him. Oh, so that's how they sit, thought Susan. The robin fluttered back into his pocket and began to make rustling noises inside it. Just as she was wondering if there was a father robin, another little bird suddenly hopped out from his hiding place under the scarecrow's wide-brimmed hat. Susan leant forward and touched the scarecrow on the knee. She longed to be friendly with anybody who kept robins in a coat pocket. Uh, what's your name? she asked. Uh, Gummidge, he replied. I'm Wurzel Gummidge. I chose the name this morning. Me grandfather's name was Bogle. <laughs> well, Gummidge isn't a very pretty name, objected Susan. No, he replied. I it's as ugly as I am. Susan looked at him. His hat was awry over his turnipy face. But she noticed that he had managed to bend his knees a little and that his fingers, which two minutes before had looked like bits of stick, were more human now. They even showed lumps that might possibly be mistaken for knuckles. He was growing less like a scarecrow every minute. Gummidge isn't pretty, she said, but it's a very interesting name. Oh, I, he agreed. Um, how old are you? asked Susan. Oh, all manner of ages replied the scarecrow. Me face is one age, and me feet is another, and me arms, me arms are the oldest of all. How oh, very, very odd, said Susan. Oh, that is it is usual with scarecrows, replied Gummidge, and it's a good way to, I get a lot of birthdays. One for me face, and another for me middle, and another for me hands, and so on. But do you get presents? Well, I haven't had many so far, confessed Gummidge. Do you often walk about? asked Susan. Oh, never done it before, declared Gummidge, but I says to myself last night, when I was standing in Ten Acre Field, I says to myself, Wurzel, you ought to go about the world and see things, same as what the rabbits do. I mean, what's the use of having smart legs, I said, if you don't use them? With that, Gummidge stroked his shabby trousers proudly. So this evening, after the rooks had stopped acting silly, I pulled up my feet <laughs> and I walked about a bit. And then, I, and then I went up to the sheep pens and had a bit of a talk with one of the ewes. Which one? asked Susan. Eliza. Y y you know, her that has the black face, replied Gummidge. Um, has she got lambs? asked Susan. Oh, aye. Yes, she's got a black son and a white daughter. She says they're the finest lambs in Scatterbrook and that they're wearing the best tails she's ever seen. Um, why did you come here? asked Susan. Well, I thought about going to London instead. I, I thought I'd go to London till I met a mouse in the lane and she changed my mind for me. Well, why did she? Well, she'd been to London herself. She was a field mouse. She stowed herself away in a market basket and, and she saw Piccadilly. Did she like it? asked Susan. Well, I don't know about that. As she said, they, they told such lies in London. There's a place there called St. Martin's in the Fields, and it isn't in the fields at all. And, and then there's another place called Shepherd Market, and she said there wasn't one shepherd there. So she said London was all a sham, and that it was trying to copy Scatterbrook, so she came home again. Uh, are you going to stay in Scatterbrook? asked Susan eagerly. She'd taken a bit of a fancy to Wurzel Gummidge. Ah, uh, well, I might, said Gummidge carelessly. Then his head drooped forward, and he fell fast asleep. <laughs>
the crackling of the fire, the singing of the kettle, and the soft, powdery shuffle of falling ashes blended themselves into a jumble of sound, and Susan, too, fell asleep. When she awoke, morning had slipped unnoticed into her bedroom, and she remembered having been tucked into bed very late indeed because Mrs. Braithwaite had forgotten all about her and because Emily had not returned until eleven o'clock. She was so sleepy that it was not until she was halfway through her breakfast that she remembered anything at all about Wurzel Gummidge. Had the, um, had the scarecrow gone away when you came home, Emily? The what? asked Emily. Oh, eat up your bread and marmalade, for goodness sake, said Mrs. Braithwaite. We're late as it is. Susan sighed. After breakfast, she told John all about Wurzel Gummidge. But he said she must have been dreaming, and that the scarecrow was still in the field. If it hadn't been for the lambs, Susan herself might have thought that the scarecrow's visit was only a dream. But when Farmer Braithwaite came into the kitchen and said, Hey, what do you think the you with the black face has got? Susan knew the answer. I know, I know, she cried. She's got a black son and a white daughter, and they're wearing the best tails she's ever seen. Well, I never... "'Who's been telling you that?' asked the farmer. "'Gummidge,' said Susan. "'Gummidge?' the farmer looked puzzled. "'There's nobody of the name of Gummidge hereabouts.' Susan was saved from answering because Mrs. Braithwaite called, "'George! George!' So away went the farmer, leaving Susan to triumph over John. "'What did I say? What did I say?' she shouted. And as if she hadn't said enough to prove that Wurzel Gummidge really had paid a visit to the farm, a tiny brown feather fluttered down from the kitchen mantelpiece. And that, that belongs to his robin, said Susan. Presently, Susan forgot all about Wurzel Gummidge, but the sun came out and shone so brightly that Emily said the children had better have a picnic up on the top of Beacon Hill. A picnic in spring is really an adventure. They reached the top of the hill by eleven o'clock, and then they had lunch because they simply couldn't wait for it any longer. Susan didn't remember Gummidge again until she passed the top of Ten Acre Field on the way home. He must have gone for a long walk, she said, as she pointed to the empty field. Oh, I expect Mr Braithwaite moved him to another field, said John. Just then, a little cock robin flipped over the hedge. Wife, 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 he scolded. There, you see, cried Susan. Gummidge has gone for a walk, and he's taken the nest and Mrs Robin with him. But John wasn't listening to Susan. He was staring down the lane. Somewhere in front of them walked Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton, and by her side, keeping pace with her mincing steps, was Wurzel Gummidge. He was moving sideways, and so, of course, he was looking straight into her face. That's Gummidge, cried Susan. It can't be, said John, but he sounded rather doubtful all the same. The children could see that Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton was very agitated by the way the feathers on her hat bobbed about. Susan could scarcely believe what she was seeing. John laughed. Some tramp must have stolen the clothes off that old scarecrow, he said. Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton turned aside and began to walk towards a gap in the hedge, but Gummidge followed her. By this time the children were near enough to hear what was being said. Tain't fair, said Gummidge. Other folks did ought to take their turns. But you, uh, you forget yourself, snapped Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton. Oh, not me, said Gummidge. Now listen here, missus, all I want is for you to take a turn at scaring while I walks about a bit. Should be easy for you with those whiskety feathers in your bonnet. I don't know what you're talking about. Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton shook her umbrella in a threatening way. Oh, hey, that's fine, shouted Gummidge encouragingly. You just keep on trying like that and you'll make a fine scarecrow. Uh, uh, good morning, said Susan. Oh, good morning, Susan, said Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton in a reproving voice. Oh, good morning, John. Now you children had better come home with me. She lowered her voice. I've been having a good deal of trouble with this disgusting tramp. He's followed me all the way down the lane. Um, he isn't exactly a tramp, you know, said Susan. He's... Uh, Don't argue, dear, said Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton. Now come along, John. Yeah, well, I I'll come too, remarked Gummidge to Susan. This bird and I, he waved a stiff arm towards Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton. She isn't a bird, whispered Susan. 
as she could scarcely speak for laughing. As a matter of fact, at that very moment, Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton did look rather like an angry turkey. Her face and neck were quite red with temper. Well, maybe she's not a bird yet. Here Gummidge pulled gently at one of the feathered plumes in the lady's hat. Some be slow fledges. Don't answer him, said Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton. Don't speak to him. The man must be quite mad. Once more, Gummidge tweaked at a feather, and Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton tossed her head so haughtily that her hat came right off in the scarecrow's hand. Molten, he said sorrowfully. Come away, said Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton to the children. Uh, come away. I shall go straight to the policeman and ask him to put this man under restraint. Gathering her rustly skirt above her plump knees, she almost ran down the lane that led to the village. Gummidge looked after her sadly. Oh, what a waste of a fine scarecrow, he muttered. Then he sat down on a heap of stones and began to take the hat to pieces. I don't think you ought to do that, said Susan in her primmest voice. All the same, she was delighted to see the wreck of Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton's hat, for its owner was not a very nice person. I think he ought, said John suddenly. It was the first time he'd spoken since the children had met the scarecrow. Gummidge looked up and grinned. Here, yeah, me and your sister here get on very nicely together, he remarked. Then he began to tear a feather into shreds, muttering, She loves me, she loves me not, all the time he was doing it. John pulled Susan aside and began to whisper to her. Do you think he really is a scarecrow? I know he is, said Susan firmly. Then we'll be able to have some fun with him. We can play with him. She loves me not, wailed Gummidge. Oh, it does seem a pity. Well, who doesn't love you, asked Susan. That bird was said she wasn't a bird, Gummidge sniffed miserably. Oh, she's a horrid old thing, said John consolingly. She wants to teach everyone how to behave. Well, th th that's just what I want to know, said Gummidge. And snatching Father Robin from his shoulder, he wiped his damp face with the bird's wing. I, I was thinking how nicely we might have got on together, her in the field and me out of it. Me in it and, and her out of it. Well, well, we'll show you how to play with us. Yeah, but you're, you're not full growed sighed Gummidge. Just then, a loud bellow sounded behind them, and a dun-coloured cow put her head over the fence. Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton's coming back, shouted John. I can see her head bobbing along around the corner. Oh, maybe she's changed her mind, said Gummidge, and a pleased smile stretched over his face. He jerked himself out of his coat, and he hung it on a hedge stake, and then he sat down stiffly. You'd better run away, said Susan to Gummidge. Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton's bringing the policeman with her. The scarecrow didn't answer, but he dropped the hat and sat quite still. A strange procession was coming down the lane. It was headed by Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton and the village policeman. Behind them came the milkman, two farm labourers, the village postmistress and several children. To go, whispered Susan. You'll be put in prison if you don't, said John. The scarecrow sat so still that the children found it difficult to believe that he'd ever moved. Nearer and nearer came Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton and the village crowd. The dun-coloured cow mooed disconsolately, and so loudly that Susan and John felt perfectly certain that she too was asking Gummidge to run away. And then, when the policeman was within a few yards of him, Gummidge spoke to the cow. Neither of the children could hear the words, but Susan declared afterwards that the cow must have understood, for she nodded, or anyway lowered her horns. And then Gummidge sat down on the ground again. Oh, there he is, shouted Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton, and she pointed her finger at Gummidge from the place where she stood. Then something very amazing happened. The dun-coloured cow charged through the hedge, and lowering her horns, ran straight for Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton. Now, ordinarily... She was quite a placid enough cow, but now she seemed to have gone quite mad. She kicked up her heels and she ran straight through the crowd. Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton scrambled for the opposite hedge. The cow stopped long enough to thrust a horn through the hat on the ground and then charged after her. The policeman and the postmistress and the milkman and the labourers and the children all joined in the chase, and right across the field scooted Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton with her petticoats flying in the wind. John and Susan stood on the gate and watched. 
They saw Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton scramble over a distant gate, and then they saw the cow, who was still wearing the hat on her left horn, turn aside and begin to eat grass. She looked as though she'd never chased anyone in the whole of her peaceful life. You know, I do believe Gummidge told the cow to chase people, said Susan. Oh, rot, said John. He jumped down from the gate and ran towards Gummidge. The scarecrow was lying on his back quite still by the side of the road. His eyes were closed. Gummidge had turned himself back into a scarecrow. Now, you see, said Susan triumphantly, he is a scarecrow. Why, why what, whatever's happened to his nose? He hasn't got one, said John. It was perfectly true. There was only a little earthy nobble in the middle of a very old turnip. It's very odd, said John. Do you think the tramp was a magician? Of course he wasn't a magician, said Susan. He was never a tramp at all. He was just a scarecrow who came alive, and now he's gone dead again, just as I was getting fond of him. And she burst into tears. Hush, said John. Somebody's coming back. The policeman's helmet appeared over the top of the hedge. He climbed over the gate, and a little boy followed him. John and Susan were just in time to slip behind the hedge. Oh, he's gone, mister, said the little boy. No, he hasn't. He's there, see? And he pointed a grimy finger towards Gummidge. The policeman stepped across the road. That's so. Uh, only an old scarecrow, he said. Cool said the little boy. That's Farmer Braithwaite's scarecrow out of Ten Acre Field. How did it get here, mister? Well, how should I know, said the policeman. We can't do with old rubbish littering up the roadside. He stooped down and hoisted Gummidge onto his shoulder. Cool, said the little boy. He's all stuffed with straw. Here goes, grunted the policeman, and he heaved Gummidge over the hedge. John looked at Susan, and Susan looked at John, but neither of them spoke. Magic is ordinary enough in a book, but it seems a queer thing in real life. I'm afraid he's dead, said Susan, as she glanced down at the turnip face. Well, perhaps he's only pretending, said John. If he'd stayed alive, said Susan at last, if he'd stayed alive, or even if he'd only pretended to be alive, I think he would have been a very great friend of ours. It must be tea time now, said John, so we'd better go. Mrs. Braithwaite will be cross if we're late. Besides, we don't want any grown-ups to ask reasons. But we'll come back the second afterwards, said Susan. She said it rather loudly, so the gummage could hear. It seemed rather a long way back to the village. Everything seemed very dull and uninteresting. And just as they reached Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton's horrid-looking red house, Susan stopped. She sniffed, then fumbled in the pocket of her jersey. Oh, bother. I've left my handkerchief behind, she said. Well, use mine, said John. No, thanks. Besides, it's a, it's a rather important birthday present handkerchief. Uh, we, we must go back. It didn't take them long to reach the gap in the hedge. Suddenly, they were startled by a very peculiar sound from the other side of the hedge. It sounded like a, a muffled motor horn, and it ended in a splutter. They heard a sniff, and then another splutter, and then the odd honking noise again. They crept quietly through the hedge, and as they did this, they heard a sudden movement on the grass. Gummidge was still flat on his back, but by his side, crumpled into a tight ball, lay Susan's handkerchief. He's been using it, she cried. They waited for some moments, but nothing happened. Well, well, go away and leave him, said John loudly. Then he put his fingers to his lips, and he beckoned to Susan to follow him back onto the road. Listen, he whispered, if Gummidge had used your handkerchief, he must have a nose, mustn't he? I mean, if he has grown a nose again, then it must be turning into a real person again. So let's keep very still and watch. They lay flat on the roadside and peered through the hedge. Presently, Gummidge's right foot stirred a little. Then his left one moved. He sat up stiffly and looked cautiously about him. Gummidge, called John. Gummidge took no notice at all. Wurzel Gummidge, whispered Susan. Won't you talk to us? But he continued to stare moodily up at the sky. I believe he's offended with us, said Susan to John, as she stooped down and stroked Gummidge's shirt sleeve. 
He shook himself angrily. What's the matter? she asked. Leave me be, he replied. I'm sulky. Well, sometimes I sulks for hours and sometimes I sulks for weeks. It's in the family, but we're all the same. It's very, very horrid to sulk, said Susan. Well, it hurts nobody, said Gummidge. My old nurse often says it hurts nobody, and she should know. Have you still got a nurse? asked John in amazement. Have you still got a nurse, a great scarecrow of your age? Oh, you leave me be, said Gummidge. Leave me be and let me have Miss Sulk in peace. Tell us about what you did when you were little, Big John. And Susan added, I'm sure you must have been a very dear little scarecrow. I never was little, declared Gummidge indignantly. Nor were Grandfather Bogle, neither. And he looked angry again. Well, tell us how you began, said John. I didn't begin. I, I was put together in, in a mortal hurry. It is the same with all of us. We, we, we stay the size we're made, and we're made to fit our clothes. Why? asked John. Well, it's, it's only sense. Then what'll happen when your clothes wear out? asked Susan. Oh, they was wore out long before I had them, explained Gummidge proudly. Me trousers was wore out, but the squire and the vicar, he wore me coat out. The more wore out clothes is, the better they is for scaring rooks. But who made you? asked John. Oh, nobody in particular, said Gummidge. Me face was carved out of a turnip by a chap who came edging and ditching. He just took a clasp knife and he hacked it away. And then some other folks brought the broom handles and a bit of straw. They soon had me set up and into the sacking, and then they put me clothes on. Oh, I was a lovely fit, so me old nurse tells me. This place, I was a grand fit until the spadges came. Here Gummidge sighed deeply and patted the robin's nest. Well, what did the sparrows do? asked Susan. They stole my stomach, sighed Gummidge sadly. Oh, how horrid of them, said Susan with a shudder. What did they want it for? I had to make their pesky nests with. Once more, Gummidge's face was covered with the unhappy moisture that Susan had noticed before. He fumbled for Susan's handkerchief and wiped his face proudly. What I don't understand, says Susan, is how do you turn yourself from a scarecrow into a person? Ah, replied Gummidge. That would be telling, that would. Oh, do tell, begged Susan. John said scornfully, I don't believe he knows himself. I don't agreed Gummidge. Your sort turns into men, but, but you don't know how you does it. It's a changeable world, isn't it? Well, I must get back to me rook scaring now. He rose stiffly to his feet. Good day to you. See you in the morning. John awakened early the next morning, and jumping out of bed, he rushed across to the window. He gazed across the fields to where Gummidge, looking like a very untidy crow, was waving raggedly arms at the rooks. Susan was awake, too. She lay in her bed and wondered if Gummidge would come and see them, or if they would be able to go and see Gummidge. She thought it would be better for the Scarecrow not to come to the farm too often. Probably, Emily would not think he was a fit sort of person for them to play with. After breakfast, Mr. Braithwaite asked John if he would go into Penfold and buy a copy of the Exchange and Mart from the station bookstore. A very good idea, said Mrs. Braithwaite. That'll keep him quiet. John and Susan did not think it was at all a good idea, but they couldn't possibly explain that they would rather not go to Penfold because they wanted to play with the Scarecrow. They did not get back again until eleven o'clock, and as they returned through the village street, they noticed that all the old ladies who lived in the thatched cottages were leaning over walls, chattering and gossiping. Even the most friendly of them only nodded hastily to Susan and John. When they reached the farm, they pushed the newspaper in through the parlour window, and then they made their way round to the kitchen door. Mrs. Briggs, the village washerwoman, was sitting in the rocking chair, swinging herself violently backwards and forwards, her shining face looking very agitated. She spoke in short jerks. I wouldn't mind so much if it wasn't for Mrs. Bloomsby Barton's new chemises. Oh, don't take on so, my dear, said Mrs. Braithwaite. What's the matter? asked Susan, and John echoed. Yes, what's the matter? Nobody took the slightest notice of the children. I wouldn't mind so much if it wasn't for the squire's vests. 
All trimmed with lace, they were. You don't say, cried Mrs. Braithwaite. <laughs> You'd never guess to look at him, and him such a nice, quiet gentleman. It's Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton's chemises that have got lace on them. Mrs. Braithwaite, who was bustling about the kitchen, stopped and said, Now just you tell me all about it. The washerwoman gulped. Well, it's a beautiful drying morning. Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton's chemises looked a treat, and so did the squire's vests and the policeman's pyjamas. I'd washed them beautiful, and I set them on the line. I'd gone into the house to make myself a nice cup of tea, same as I always do, when I saw a shadow past the window. Oh, it made me come all over queer, but I said to myself, Now, you just have a nice cup of tea and rest your poor arms. It's a beautiful drying morning. So I had my cup of tea, and then suddenly it come on to rain. So I went out to the green to take in the clothes. Oh, dearie me today, oh, dearie me today. Once more, the washerwoman broke down. Go on, said Mrs. Braithwaite. The washing was gone, moaned Mrs. Briggs. The washing was gone, and the line was as bare as me arm. Oh, you don't say, said Mrs. Braithwaite. Maybe someone's having a game with you, she suggested. Oh, Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton will have a game with me when she hears of it. Oh, she'll have a game and all, and her without her chemises. Oh, maybe a tramp took them, said Mrs. Braithwaite. What about gummage? whispered John to Susan. Well, I'd best be moving, said the washerwoman. I'll go and tell the policeman. Not that he's much use at finding things. I think we'd better go and have a look for gummage, said Susan, as soon as the washerwoman was out of sight. John nodded solemnly. But when they reached Ten Acre Field, the scarecrow had vanished. As they were crossing a corner of the field, Susan noticed something black and raggedy hanging in the hedge. Gummage's coat, she cried. Perhaps he's gone to sleep in the ditch. But though they made quite sure that the coat was Gummidge's because of the robin's nest in the pocket, there was no sign of the scarecrow himself. Susan asked the robin where Gummidge had gone, but of course the little bird did not answer. She looked as though she were keeping the most important secret in the world. It's rather noble of him to leave his coat for the robin, isn't it, said Susan. Perhaps he's descended from Sir Walter Raleigh. They hunted about for a little bit longer. And then they decided to go home. After they'd finished lunch, Susan and John went into the orchard again. It was a good place to play in. Just as they were wondering whether the big apple tree in the far corner should be a house or a ship, they heard the sound of tearing calico. An enormously fat woman was climbing over the hedge. Oh, she looked like a giant plum pudding on legs. Her head was too small for her huge body, and she wore a sunbonnet that nearly covered her face. She balanced for a second on the top of the hedge, and then sh she caught her foot, tumbled over, and rolled towards the children. Whoever can she be? asked Susan, looking timidly at the shapeless mass on the ground. The woman was certainly dressed very oddly. She appeared to be wound about with sheets, and she grasped a string of knotted handkerchiefs. This was so long that it had not finished following her over the hedge. She revolved rapidly for some seconds, and when she stopped, John, who had excellent manners, said, oh, I, I do hope you haven't hurt yourself. The white bundle wriggled violently. Can I help you? asked John. Oh, I said a familiar voice. There was another jerk of the sunbonnet, and the knobbly face of Gummidge beamed up at the children. Oh! said Susan, that it was you all the time. Of course it were. You took the washing off the clothesline, said John. Ah, who else? <laughs> Took quite easy. Why shouldn't I take my turn? Other folks had worn the clothes all the week. I wanted to give the rooks a good scare. <laughs> and I did too. Here he broke off and chuckled wheezily. But it's very, very naughty of you, said Susan. The poor washerwoman was so worried about Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton's chemises. Gummidge looked terribly sulky. I don't want the pesky things. I kept on stepping on them wherever I trod. <laughs>
then they'll be all muddy, said Susan. Yeah, sure it'd be, agreed the scarecrow. Now give us a bit of help. He rolled over onto his back and lay there with his legs and arms sticking stiffly in the air. Come on, let's unroll him, said John. The two of them seized the outside sheet and began to tug at it. Even then, it took quite a long time to get the sheets off Gummidge. They were twisted in the most amazing manner and were terribly muddy. Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton's remises were knotted together and tied sashways round an enormous pair of pink pyjamas. The scarecrow was not in the least helpful. But Susan, who was quite good at undressing dolls, managed somehow or other to tug the clothes off the stiff limbs. Ah, that's better, said Gummidge. That's quite a deal better. Suddenly, he bellowed rather in the manner of a sick cow, for John had stuck a safety pin at the back of his neck. Oh, do be quiet, begged Susan. Anybody think you were killed? Anyone might think right, too, roared Gummidge. I'm going to have a, a real good soak now. Oh, don't, pleaded Susan, but it was too late. Already Gummidge's features had melted into the turnip of his face, and his limbs were rigid. It's perfectly beastly of him, grumbled John. He might try to help. Suddenly they heard Emily Goodenough's voice. I wouldn't have believed it of you, she said. Susan and John raised their untidy heads and saw a row of angry faces peeping at them from over the orchard hedge. Mr. and Mrs. Braithwaite, the washerwoman, and Emily must have heard Gummidge's shrieks. I wouldn't have believed it, repeated Emily. Susan and John looked imploringly at Gummidge. He lay on his back with one torn bath towel wrapped around his neck. His arms were stretched out straight on either side of him, and altogether he looked the most raggedy scarecrow in the world. I couldn't have believed it, said Emily. Now, what have you got to say for yourselves? Neither Susan nor John had anything to say, for they knew Emily would never believe their story. Well, you, you see, began Susan miserably, it's the scarecrow, said John. Oh, anyone can see that, roared the farmer. And who told you to take it out of my field, I should like to know. Oh, we were only trying to help, Susan explained. We took the clothes off him as quickly as ever we could, but we didn't get them muddy. No, agreed John. They, they, they sort of got muddy. After that, everyone began to talk at once. That is, everyone except Gummidge. Emily scolded, and Susan began to cry. And all the time, Wurzel Gummidge lay on his back in a dead sulk. Suddenly, Mrs. Braithwaite began to be rather kind. She told Emily that children would be children. I wish scarecrows wouldn't be scarecrows, muttered John, which was unwise of him. Well, this one won't be a scarecrow for long, said Farmer Braithwaite. I shall have him pitched onto the bonfire first thing tomorrow morning. He climbed over the hedge, and it gave Gummidge a kick. Oh, you couldn't be so cruel, sobbed Susan. Farmer Braithwaite picked Gummidge up, flung him over one shoulder, and a melancholy procession returned to the farm. There they saw the farmer fling Gummidge into an empty stable and turn the key in the door. Susan and John felt rather muddled the next morning. They were still angry with Gummidge for letting them be scolded for his tiresome adventure. But all the same, they could not help feeling sorry for him. For the stable, where he had spent the night, was such a dull, gloomy place. Let's go and peep through the stable window, said Susan outside in the yard. Shall we go and ask Gummidge why he was so horrid yesterday? No, replied John. It's our turn to sulk now. Just then, Emily came bustling into the yard and asked the children to go to the vicarage and find out what time the jumble sale would begin. What jumble sale? asked Susan. What, what is a jumble sale? asked John. Now, run along, do, there's good children, and don't stop to worry me with questions. Emily seemed to have forgotten her crossness of the day before, and the children thought they'd better not remind her of it by arguing, and so they hurried away. They rang the doorbell as Mrs. Parsons was saying to her husband, uh, do you think the squire's trousers are worth half a crown? Mrs. Parsons was as brisk as her husband was dawdlesome, and as plump and perky as he was slow. She looked in a great hurry. 
Susan repeated Emily's message, but Mrs. Parsons didn't seem to be listening. She pointed to some wisps of straw that littered the hall and said, Such a strange-looking man came here this morning. He was begging for a coat. I told him that he'd better come to the jumble sale this afternoon, but he said he hadn't any money. I said I would pay him if he could cut the grass for us, but he said he couldn't do that until this evening. He was very queer. Just look at all those wisps of straw. He shook them out of his shirt sleeves. Susan looked, and at once she was reminded of Wurzel Gummidge. Surely nobody else would be so untidy. As they came home through a small paddock that opened onto the farmyard, they passed a great pile of rubbish that had been heaped ready for burning. As they picked their way through the mud, they were startled by a particularly violent sneeze. Gummidge, whispered Susan. I'm sure it must be Gummidge. Don't take any notice of them, begged John. Susan simply couldn't help looking round. She saw Gummidge lying in a most uncomfortable position on the rubbish heap. His head was hanging down and his legs stuck helplessly in the air. Morning, he wheezed. Come on, said John, and he ran through the farmyard gate. Morning, repeated Gummidge pathetically. He looked so miserable that Susan couldn't help speaking to him. You were horrid not to tell Mrs. Braithwaite that it was your fault about the washing, she said reproachfully. Well, I'm not much of a one for talking to strangers, explained Gummidge modestly. I generally sulks when I'm spoken to a sudden. It's a, it's a form of shyness. You'd never believe how shy I am. He struggled violently, and presently he managed to sit up with his back to Susan. Well, why are you on this horrid old rubbish heap, she asked. Because I've been thrown away, said Gummidge sadly. I'm going to be burned this evening, so the farmer says. Oh, how very, very horrid, said Susan. Isn't it? replied Gummidge cheerily. But then you see, it's in the family. They always burns one of my cousins every 5th of November. But are the Guy Fawkes alive? asked Susan in horror. She'd always enjoyed fireworks and bonfires. Well, they're alive on and off, same as me. So, I don't want to be burnt. I'd arranged to have the vicarage grass cut this evening, and it does seem a pity. Oh, oh I, it does seem a pity. But why do you stay here? asked Susan. Well, cause I'm used to staying where I'm put, replied Gummidge forlornly. Susan climbed up onto the rubbish heap beside him, and then she began to talk to him in the way that she talked to dolls and puppies and babies. She wiped his muddy face with her handkerchief, and presently she helped him to get up and hand in hand she and Gummidge went across the fields together. Susan was determined that the scarecrow should not sit still and wait to be burnt. They went into Ten Acre Field, where Susan found his coat in the hedge and helped him into it, though Father Robin was very indignant. And then, once more, putting her hand into his knobbly one, she led him along the little winding lane to the spinney. I think you'd better hide here for a bit, she said. What are you going to eat for your dinner? Oh, I don't know, said Gummidge. Bits of roots, maybe. Or maybe the squirrels will help me find a bit of something. And then Susan left him, for she didn't want to be late for her own dinner. In the afternoon, John and Susan went to the vicarage jumble sale with Emily Goodenough, who seemed to have forgotten all about their whooping cough. When they reached the vicarage, they saw that the lawn was covered with stalls, which were heaped with old clothes and odds and ends from half a dozen attics. Presently John got tired of the stalls, and he wandered away by himself, leaving Susan sandwiched between two fat old ladies who each wanted the same flannel petticoat. She was so interested in their quarrel and in all the other wranglings that she didn't even hear Emily Goodenough's cries of, Time to go home, Miss Susan! So after a while, she wandered off in the direction of the shrubbery. She was just going to push through the laurels that bordered a big circular lawn when John came towards her. He was looking as excited as though he had just found a bird's nest. Gummidge is here, whispered John. Come and see, but don't make a sound, whatever you do. He dropped down onto his hands and knees and began to crawl through the bushes. Susan followed him. John put his finger to his lips and very, very softly pulled the branch back until Susan could see the wide stretch of lawn. Gummidge was there, sitting on a garden roller. His legs were straddled and he was making a queer crooning sound. 
all around him, covering the grass so thickly that every daisy was hidden, were rabbits. There were hundreds of them, and they were huddled together so closely that they looked like a soft grey rug. Listen, whispered John, and Susan kept so still that you could hear the strange tearing noise of a thousand rabbits all busy nibbling. It was the most extraordinary sight that Susan had ever seen. Every now and then, Gummidge changed the tune of his crooning, and when he did this, the rabbits gathered themselves together and lolloped forward. The places they left were bitten close and clean. Oh, said Susan, forgetting to speak in a whisper. At the sound of her voice, one of the smallest rabbits sat up and looked about him. They very nearly finished now. Whispered John, "I must go and play with them," said Susan, and she scrambled to her feet and ran into the middle of the lawn. She was never quite certain afterwards about what really happened, for in a moment she was lying flat on the grass with John beside her, while baby and old and middle-aged rabbits scuttered across her back and over her shoulders. And when she stood up again, every rabbit was gone, and Gummidge was sitting on the garden roller and whistling a dreary little tune to himself. The grass was as close and smooth as a tablecloth. There was not a blade out of place, not a daisy or a buttercup anywhere. The children felt suddenly shy of Gummidge. Up until then, they'd thought of him as a queer, silly thing, half scarecrow, half human. But his behaviour with the rabbits showed that he was a kind of wizard as well. They felt afraid. Morning! Shouted Gummidge. And when he showed his untidy teeth, he didn't feel shy any longer. How did you manage to cut the grass with rabbits? Asked John. I didn't, replied Gummidge. I ate it with rabbits. Now, if I was a gardener, I'd be something like a gardener. I'd cut the edges with cows, so I would, and I and I'd kill all the worms with moles. He got up from the roller and began to move sideways across the lawn. Where are you going? Asked Susan. I'm going for my wages, of course," replied Gummidge. "The vicar promised me half a crown to cut his lawn for him. Why don't you walk straight?" asked John crossly. "Well, if it comes to that, why don't you walk sideways?" retorted Gummidge. "Well, why should we?" asked Susan. "I hate walking with someone who's looking into my ear all the time," said John. "I do wish you'd walk straight." He seized hold of one of Gummidge's arms as he spoke, and Susan took the other one. And between them, they managed to get the scarecrow into a very nearly straightforward walking position. Talking is spring, began Gummidge conversationally. Have you ever heard tell? And then, before the children had time to be astonished at his extraordinary behaviour, he jerked his hands free from theirs and lay in a dead sulk at their feet. Susan, who'd been walking with her head in the air, stumbled over the scarecrow's arm and fell flat on her face. So she didn't notice that Farmer Braithwaite, who'd walked through one of the openings in the hedge, was staring at them angrily. "Hey, how many times have I got to tell you to leave that scarecrow alone?" he asked. "Anyone would think you were daft to go dragging that thing over to the vicarage." "Well, we didn't," said Susan as she got up from the grass. "Didn't you take it off the rubbish heap?" "Well, well, sort of," agreed Susan. "But we, we didn't bring him here." "I suppose you'll tell me he walked next," went on Farmer Braithwaite. In a particularly horrid way. If we say he did, th- then you'll say he didn't," said John, who decided that he simply would not be bullied. The farmer strode towards them and prodded Gummidge with a stick. Oh, oh, "Oh, please don't do that," begged Susan. "He's had such a lot of trouble with his inside already." "What's that?" "Hey," asked the farmer. "Um,、uh, the 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 sparrow stole it," explained John. "The sparrow stole it," repeated Farmer Braithwaite. Ah, the sparrows stole it indeed. That's likely. That is, they flew with him and dropped him under the lawn here. I suppose. He was interrupted by a little cry from John. He's moving, he said squeakily. He's coming out of his sulk. Look. Certainly, Gummidge was stirring. Little rustly noises seemed to be coming from inside him. Now, perhaps you will believe us," shouted Susan defiantly. Aye, tis queer. Muttered the farmer. Ah, I thought so. He whisked the corner of Gummidge's coat aside with his stick. Mole said Farmer Braithwaite, and so it was.
the stirring of a gummage had only been caused by some small and probably obstinate mole who had refused to be disturbed in the middle of his tunnelling. Farmer Braithwaite made a sound that was partly anger and partly grunt, and then he stooped down and once again swung gummage onto his shoulder. And now he really will be burned, said Susan sadly. But gummage was not burned, although he might have been if every stall at the jumble sale had not been stripped bare. The truth was that all the guests at the vicarage were longing for even more exciting bargains. So when Farmer Braithwaite appeared on the lawn with gummage on his back, a shout went up from a group of lads. How much, mister? Let's sell the old scarecrow, shouted Mrs Briggs. Yeah, let's sell the scarecrow, clamoured all the little children. Farmer Braithwaite hesitated, and then he smiled. Yeah, let's sell the scarecrow, he echoed. And then before Susan or John could do or say anything, one of the men set gummage in a chair on the top of a trestle table. The postman seized a hammer and the auction began. Gummidge was still looking most extraordinarily sulky, and yet the rocking of the chair gave him a very lifelike look, even though it did jolt his head in a rather terrifying manner. Now, nobody particularly wanted Gummidge, but everyone loves an auction sale, and so a great many people began to call out, Sixpence! A shilling! One and six! in a very excited way. Some of them only nodded, though, and one old lady who was sitting alone on the front bench kept jerking her head violently. Can't we buy them? asked John. But they were interrupted by a shout of, Go on to Mrs. Kibbins for five shillings. The old lady in the front bench sat up with a jerk. Hey, What's that? she said. You've got the scarecrow, shouted the postman. Well, what, what'd she say? asked Mrs. Kibbins. You bought the scarecrow, said the postman, and he carried the limp figure of Gummidge over to Mrs. Kibbins. Oh, I've done no such thing, she said. You've been nodding all the time, said the postman, and a nod means a bid, as everyone knows. Maybe you were asleep, missus, shouted little Tommy Higginsthwaite. Now, as a matter of fact, Mrs. Kibbins had been asleep during the sale, but she hated Tommy Higginsthwaite, who always stole her fruit. So she took five shillings out of her pocket and said, Oh, I'll be very glad of that scarecrow. He'll help me to keep two-legged birds out in me garden. All birds is two-legged, jeered Tommy Higginsthwaite. However, Mrs. Kibben simply turned her back on him and seized hold of Gummidge by one of his broomstick arms. His legs trailed along the grass and his head flopped wearily onto his own rustling shoulder. And all the while, Father Robin flew from bush to bush, crying, Wife! 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 in such a distressed way that Susan rushed up to Mrs. Kibbins and said, there, There's a robin's nest in his coat pocket, so uh, please be careful of it and don't let Tommy Higginsthwaite see it. Well, now, did you ever? exclaimed Mrs. Kibbins. But as she was quite a kind old lady, she promised that she would be careful, and she turned Gummidge sideways so that the nest should not be crushed. It was quite a long time before the children were able to talk to Gummidge again. Every time they passed Mrs. Kibbins' cottage, they peered over the wall. He stood in the middle of Mrs. Kibbins' potato patch. Every time the wind blew, he waved his raggedy arms dutifully. But his face was set and sulky, and he never showed the slightest sign of being anything but a very ordinary scarecrow. He must be furious at having been sold as if he were a common bag of coals, said Susan. But after all, it wasn't our fault. Do look at the way he's swinging round. He seems to be in the most frightful temper. Certainly Gummidge was more active than he had been in the days when he stirred the rooks out of Ten Acre Field. But that was because Mrs. Kibbins had tied him to a broomstick, which he had planted in a sunken drainpipe. His straw boots were several inches above ground, and whenever the wind blew, he twisted round on his stick, so that sometimes he faced the village street and sometimes turned away from it. One day... When Susan had been taken into Penfold by Mrs. Braithwaite, John wandered down the village street, and when he reached Mrs. Kibbins's house, he met the old lady coming out of her garden gate. I, um, I suppose, said John, who suddenly had an idea, I suppose you haven't any, um, any weeds in your garden. Oh, there's always weeds in gardens, reported Mrs. Kibbins. There's always weeds and children, and I don't know which is worse. They're both rampages. Oh, said John, and then he muttered, Oh, 
again and shuffled his feet. I, I suppose, he said, I, I suppose you wouldn't like me to do any weeding for you. Mrs. Kibbins looked at him suspiciously. To her, one boy was as bad as another. Oh, it don't, don't seem natural, murmured Mrs. Kibbins. No, it, it don't seem natural for a boy to want to weed. Well, I, I don't generally, explained John, but today I th thought that it might be rather fun to weed your garden. Well, well, there's no harm in it that I can see, said Mrs. Kibbins. So you can do a bit of weeding if you like, while I go to Penfold. As soon as Mrs. Kibbins was out of sight, John tiptoed across the potato patch, where Gummidge swung desolately in the wind. Good morning, he said. There was no reply. John walked round till he faced Gummidge, and then he said, Good morning, again. This time there was a faint grunt in answer. Tisn't, said Gummidge. It isn't a good morning, except for worms and such like. It's all dank and drizzling and giddy. There isn't such a thing as a giddy morning, objected John. You can't have a giddy morning. Can't I? repeated Gummidge miserably. Can't I? That's all you know about it. I've been giddy for a week now, twisting and turning and spinning, till I don't know which side of myself I'm on. Here the wind caught his arms, which were spread out like the sails of a windmill, and swung him round. And when his indignant face appeared again, he continued, I'm as dizzy as a weathercock. It, it ain't right. John began to feel quite dizzy himself. Then he thought of a plan to save Gummidge from giddiness. Scooping up several handfuls of earth, he pushed them into the drain pipe that held Gummidge's broomstick and rammed them down until all was steady. Oh, hi! <laughs> That's better, panted Gummidge gratefully. How's the field? he asked abruptly. What field? For ten acre, of course. Oh, I think it's all right, replied John. Yeah, misses me, I guess, said Gummidge. But if I stay here for a bit, I learn quite a lot. Mrs. Kibbins's daughter has a baby that takes me fancy. I, I like listening to the folks talking through the window in the evening. It's company for me. I'd like to hear a bit about the world before I'm married, you see. Are you going to be married? asked John in surprise. Somehow it was difficult to think of Gummidge as a husband. Well, I've been married some time, replied Gummidge. The trouble is, there's so few she-scarecrows hereabouts. Uh, there they used to be one in the field next to Ten Acre before it was set down for grazing. It, she wore a brown skirt and a Salvation Army bonnet, and sh she had a set of real artificial teeth that had been sent to a rummage sale by the squire's housekeeper. I always hoped to share them, but she wouldn't look at me. No, 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 she, she wouldn't look at me. Well, why not? asked John. Because her back was turned to me, of course, said Gummidge. I often wondered what her face was like. I used to cough to her in the evenings, and sometimes she'd champ her teeth at me. Yeah, I, I'm fond of love, I am, Gummidge sighed gustily. Presently he wheezed. Here, uh, have, you, have you got a knife? Yes, replied John. Well, I want to cut these pesky ropes. He fidgeted with the strands of tarred string that bound him to the post. Well, I I'll cut them, said John. I'll cut them myself when the time comes. Maybe I want to go for a walk, but it, it wouldn't do for Mrs. Kibbins to see me loose, now would it? Well, i better cut the string around your feet, said John. You can't reach it while your middle is tied to the broomstick. And if you do it afterwards, you'll fall on your face. Ah, it wouldn't do it no harm, muttered Gummidge. But at last he allowed John to cut the string around his ankles. Then he pocketed the knife, and raising his legs in the air, he closed his eyes. The garden gate creaked, and John jumped up from the ground. He'd only just time to pull up a piece of groundsel before Mrs. Kibbins walked across the potato patch. Have you, uh, have you pulled up many weeds? she said pleasantly. Well, I, 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 I pulled up this one, said John. Mrs. Kibbins looked at the dandelion. Oh, is that all? she asked. Well, it's a very nice one, isn't it? stammered John. I, I, I mean, it's, it's got a nice big root. It's better than nothing. Emily says that every little helps. He felt that he must keep on talking in case Mrs. Kibbins should notice that Gummidge's feet were untied. Mrs. Kibbins looked scornfully at the weed. Oh, oh, well, 
It, it's little enough, she said sourly. John was glad to say goodbye and go home. After that, John did not dare to ask Mrs. Kibbins if he might weed her garden again, and since there was no possible excuse for going into it, the children could only peep at Gummidge as they went down the village street. You'd never think that we were once friends, would you? said Susan sadly, as they walked along the road. You'd never think, but... Suddenly she stopped grumbling and cried. Oh, gypsies, look! A painted yellow van was rumbling and rattling down the street. A blue van followed the yellow one. Each was pulled by a skewballed pony with jingling harness. Oh, it must be splendid to be a gypsy, said John. Yes, agreed Susan. Must be lovely to wear golden rings in your ears and to have hens laying eggs for you all over the place and be able to go anywhere and never come back at all. The whole village seemed to be excited about the gypsies, and heads bobbed in and out of the upstairs windows of the cottages. Emily Goodenough told them that the annual fair always came very early to Scatterbrook. The place will be half daft, she grumbled. What with all the merry-go-rounds and swing boats and such like rubbish, there'll be no work done for a week. And as if that wasn't enough, Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton is arranging a village baby show. I wish we could take Gummidge to the fair, said Susan, as soon as Emily Goodenough had turned her back. I'm sure a ride on a merry-go-round would be a treat for him. We'd only make him giddy, said John wisely, and then he'd probably sulk, and we should have to pay for all his turns until he'd stop being cross. Well, I think we ought to tell him about the fair at least, persisted Susan, so let's go and look at him. When they reached Mrs. Kibbins's garden wall and peeped over it, they saw at once that something had happened to Gummidge. His coat sleeves were flapping more limply than usual, and instead of standing straight out from his shoulders, they hung down. His trousers sagged dismally. What's happened to him? asked John. I don't know, replied Susan, but he looks quite different, doesn't he? Suddenly she gave a little cry and clutched John's arm. Isn't his hat twiddling about very queerly? And look, there's a gap between it and his coat collar. He hasn't got a neck at all. Somebody's taken his head away. How very, very horrid of them. And she burst into tears. Oh, nobody would take his head away, said John. Nobody would want it. It isn't pretty enough. Oh, I can't bear it, sobbed Susan. If he's been executed, it means he's dead. Scarecrows are never executed. Well, you never know what might happen to a person like Gummidge, wailed Susan. And I'd got so fond of him. He's the first grown-up friend we've ever had who didn't order us about. Mrs. Kibbins chanced to come out of her door at that precise moment, and her nose looked so hooky that Susan, who could not see very clearly through her tears, sobbed, I think she's a witch. I think she's done something very, very beastly to my darling Gummidge. And then before John could stop her, she turned and ran like a rabbit up the village street. And she only stopped for breath when she reached the corner of Ten Acre Field. Then she flung herself down onto the grass and sobbed miserably. John felt rather choky himself. Well, perhaps somebody's making a new face for Gummidge, he suggested. Maybe he wouldn't be the same with a new face. He wouldn't be the same without that knobbly nose. Susan stood up, and then she trailed dismally along the little lane that led to the foot of the hills. You don't think a, a cow could have eaten his head, do you? asked John. I mean, cows do eat turnips, you know, and Gummidge's face was very, very turnipy. Well, there aren't any cows in Mrs. Kibbins's garden, replied Susan. I'm so afraid that she's boiled his head. They were passing the little empty single-room cottage that stood at the foot of Beacon Hill as Susan spoke. Suddenly, she heard a cough. A queer, husky cough that could only belong to a sheep or to Gummidge. He's there, she cried, and she held up her finger. From inside the cottage there came the most peculiar crooning sound, and presently they were able to make out the words. I shall buy scary, don't be contrary. Turnips will nip you unless you are good. Wurzels will wurzel, and furzels will furzel, and bogles will fetch you unless you are good. Gummidge, shouted John. That's Gummidge's voice. 
he burst open the door and rushed inside. There was no furniture in the cottage but a wooden packing case. Gummidge was sitting on this, and in his arms was a small baby as raggedy and as reputable looking as himself. Gummidge was dressed even more peculiarly than usual. Instead of a coat, he wore a starched blue overall that had gone limp in patches. A pair of corduroy breeches stuck out from under the skirt of the overall, and these ended in brown cotton stockings and real boots. But though he now wore a ragged tweed cap with the peak at the back, his face was unchanged and his grin was as wide as ever. Hush, said Gummidge, and he held up a twig of a finger. Don't wake the baby. We thought you were dead, cried Susan. Oh, not I, said Gummidge. I don't do things like that in a hurry. But we saw you in Mrs. Kibbins's garden about half an hour ago. Your head was gone. Yeah, of course it were, said Gummidge. It were on me, weren't it? And I've been here all the morning. I don't go leaving me head about. I was brought up to be tidy, I were. Well, why are you dressed like that, asked John, though Susan kicked him hard. Just to make a nice change, said Gummidge airily. And to give the robin a rest, Mrs. Kibbins left the overall in the wash house. <laughs> it fits me a treat. That was stealing, said Susan primly. Well, I left the straw boots behind instead, said Gummidge, and I got these boots and trousers from a friend. He stuck out his legs and looked at his boots proudly. Leastways, he might have been a friend if we'd ever got to know him. But it seemed a shame to wake him up when he was sleeping so soundly. The baby stirred. Its face, like Gummidge's, was remarkably turnipy-looking. Whose is it? she asked. Well, said Gummidge slowly, I call it mine. Yes, but is it yours? asked Susan. Well, now you're asking, said Gummidge. I don't know. And you don't know, and it doesn't know. I, I, I found it in the wood. Was it growing there? asked Susan curiously. She felt that Gummidge's baby had probably sprung up in the night like a mushroom. So singularly root-like was its face. It puckered now in the most dreadfully ugly manner. Gummidge snatched a wisp of straw from his neck and began to tickle its face until it giggled. He certainly had a way with babies. Is it a baby scarecrow? asked John. Oh, it's a scare the crows are right when it yells, said Gummidge, and he held the baby up. Like to hear it? he asked. No, shouted John. What are you going to do with it? Educate it, replied Gummidge firmly. Uh, I'm going to educate it and, until it's a nice companion for me. But you can't keep a baby out in the fields all night, said Susan. Can't I? said Gummidge defiantly. Can't I? Hey, that's all you know about it. It'll die, said John. Oh, shan't let it, said Gummidge. This baby's got to learn to do as it's told, same as what the rabbits do. He rocked it violently backwards and forwards in his arms as he spoke. Now give over, Scary, he said as the baby began to pucker its face again. Uh, is it a boy? asked John. Uh, I dare say, replied Gummidge indifferently. Well, you can't keep it out all night in Mrs. Kibbins's garden, said Susan anxiously. I wasn't going to, replied Gummidge. Mrs. Kibbins's young daughter, I might take a fancy to it and change it over for her own. I like the colour of this one best. The worst is all right. Uh, oh, yes, and there's cows hereabouts. I, I can get a drop of milk for it when it wants it. And there's straw here to make a bed and all. He looked round the cottage with a beaming smile. It's rather a rough sort of place, said Susan. Well, this baby's got to be brought up rough, said Gummidge. All the same, the children noticed that he handled the baby quite gently. Let me have it, said Susan. I'm sure I know much more about babies than you do. Now, see here. You see here, you'll make me desert it if you go on like that. A lot of birds would have given up long ago. Yes, but you aren't a bird, argued John. Well, in a manner of speaking, I am retorted Gummidge. I'm a, a special sort of crow, a, a scarecrow, just as a edge sparrow is a special sort of sparrow. One scares and the other one edges. Where's the difference? Well, I'm quite sure there is a difference, said Susan, who was feeling most dreadfully muddled. 
Gummidge's face went pale green with temper. You drove me to it, he said. I will desert. And still catching the baby, he rose to his feet. Oh, please don't, said Susan. We'll, we'll, we'll go away and leave you. Gummidge sat down jerkily. Goodbye, he said. You can come and see me again when the baby's fledged. Fledged? said John. All right, haired then, said Gummidge. Haired and unwrinkled, since you're so particular. Then, then, because he looked very angry again, the children ran out of the cottage and home to tea. <laughs>